Welcome back to our seminar entitled, It's Coming. And this is Pastor Miguel Varasas. I am Pastor Mitch Williams. And we are so grateful that you have joined us, whether you are watching from your home or someplace around the world, or you are here live. We are at the Pleasant Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church in beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. And so we just want to acknowledge that you have taken the time to join us because guess what? This has been a busy week, right? And here we are Wednesday. And you know what, Pastor Miguel? Actually, Pastor John Loma King is going to give us a day off. It's going to be tomorrow night. We don't need to tune in. You can catch up, do your laundry, do whatever, and we'll be able to take a night off, and then we'll return on Friday evening. Now, perhaps you're just joining us for the first time. You've missed a couple sessions. You can go to the website, its-coming.com, and there you can view some previous presentations and get caught up. Also, you can download the lessons that go parallel with those presentations. What else can we find there on the website, Pastor McGill. Well, yes, you mentioned the Bible study lessons. You can download them. And for those that are joining us here on campus, you can take those lessons as you leave. You're taking lesson number seven tonight as you walk out the door. And for those that are watching, you're going to be downloading lesson number seven. And we want to encourage you to read it and answer it. And on Friday, Pastor John will have those answers on the screen. And you can compare your answers and make sure you write in the right answers if you didn't quite get that answer. But it's a good Good opportunity for you to study and get those lessons filled out. We also want to encourage that your questions come in on the website or here on the index card. You can get us that index card and we'll get those questions over to Pastor John and Angie as they present that Q&A um, with each one of us. And uh, we've really enjoyed that time in hearing those questions being answered. We have been so blessed uh, to be here and hear these wonderful mess, this message, these lessons, these topics have been, um, have been so good to my soul. And I hope that you have been informed, but not only informed, blessed by the message. And we just want to thank Pastor John for the beautiful message that he is presenting. Tonight we have once again the music of Tim Parton. Have you been blessed by the music? Amen. I know that I have. My heart has been filled. And tonight, he's going to be playing and singing for us for the love of God. And as soon as he is done singing that, Pastor John will come up and present tonight's topic, God's Perfect Law. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair bowed down with God gave his son to win his erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin oh love of God how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of god above would drain the ocean dry Stretched 
from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song how marvelous how wonderful and my song Amen again. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tim. It's so important to know about the love of God in light of the topic tonight. So many people think that the commandments have nothing to do with the love of God. Oh, oh, tonight I think you're going to change your mind. After we study this phenomenal Bible-based topic, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, your love is so great, so fathomless and it's a theme that throughout eternity we will still have questions to ask Father show me another way that your love has been expressed to us it is an endless theme and tonight Lord as we study your law of love may this become clear may we not see that there's a problem with it but may we see through it your greatest expression of love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. This is an amazing topic. Not that any of the others are not. But this is probably one of the most misrepresented topics in Christianity. So I begin with the question, how can something so perfect be so hated? How could something so perfect be so hated? I was on my way to New York City when my dad passed away in 2006, driving our Nissan Armada, going pretty fast, passing by a trailer truck on in the right lane, and I didn't see, and I was, long before I was able to buy a nice small GPS, I was looking down at my laptop, and as I made around the curve, there was an Indiana Highway Patrol, and I knew he caught me. And he pulled me over and he said, do you know how fast you were going? I said, uh, probably in the 80s. He said, I clocked you at 87 miles an hour. Could you tell me where you're on your way to? Well, you know, I'm on my way to New York City. My dad passed away and I'm going to clean out his apartment. He said, license and registration, please. Sure. And he came back and he tilted his hat back. He said, I'll tell you what. You slow it down, we'll call it a good evening. How about that? Now, do you think I peeled out of there burning holes in the pavement <laughs> saying, I bet you can't catch me this time? I pulled out, I think, 11 miles an hour. I was going, I was like at, right at 64 for a long time, and I realized I had just been given grace. I could have gotten mad at the office and said, you know, the problem is not how fast I was going. The problem is that speed limit that you guys posted that's irritating me, but that was not the issue. Tonight, there are many Christians that are taught by their clergy, by their leaders, that there's something wrong with God's law. It's nailed to the cross. It's done away with. It's for the Jews alone, but tonight... We are going to walk through the law of God in a way that you may have never walked through it before. So let's begin with the first question. What does the Bible teach about God's law? Let the Bible speak for itself. Psalm 19, verse 7, and we read together. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is 
sure, making wise the simple. Now, the converting aspect means when God saves you and you live in harmony with his law, you are being converted. Jesus, his righteousness is the converting power, but when you live in harmony with God's law, when you are a law-abiding citizen, you are a person that people can look to and say, he really upholds the standards of society. God's law doesn't change your character, but it shows you how to live in harmony with the perfect character of God. It makes the wise, it makes the wise, it makes wise the simple. But the Bible goes on. So when we look at the Ten Commandments on two tables of stone, don't forget the Bible begins tonight by saying, God's law is what, friends? Now let's not forget that, because if we say God's law is perfect, but, then we just cancel the fact that the Bible says God's law is what? Perfect. Let's continue. How did the psalmist David express his attitude toward God's perfect law? Psalm 40 and verse 8, he said, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is where? Within my heart. That was the Old Testament as well as the New Testament because under the New Covenant, the Lord, in Hebrews 10 verse 16, he put his law in our minds and wrote them in our hearts. The place the best place for God's law is not in our intellect, but in our hearts. Why? Because we can agree with it, but not decide to live in harmony with it. When you love something, it's in your heart. When you decide to embrace something with all of your passion, it is in your heart. And David, after his conversion, said, Lord, now after I've seen how far away I've gone, your law is now within my heart. So David agrees, God's law is a what, friends? It's a delight. So it's opposite than what people say. It's, it's, it's hard, it's, it's exacting. We're gonna see tonight. And I'm gonna try to move as fast as I can because we have quite a bit to cover. How many commandments did Moses say are in God's law? Exodus 34, verse 28. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the how many? Ten Commandments. The Lord wrote them with his finger on tables of stone. Now, why on stone? It's quite different than when he wrote in the sand in the presence of those who had accused Mary who was caught in adultery. You see, God writes our sins in the sand so they can be wiped away. But he writes his law on stone so they can be permanent like his character. And there's another phrase in the Hebrew. It's called the Decalogue meaning the 10 words. You see, in Hebrew, they look at the 10 commandments as the 10 words, the 10 laws. When God spoke, he calls it the Decalogue, like a deck of cards. Anything that begins with the word deck means 10, the 10 laws, not nine and not eight. Let's continue. New Testament now. How did Jesus teach dividing the 10 commandments into two sections? Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with how much? all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. He continues in verse 38. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor, how? As yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The word hang here doesn't mean kill. It means support. The word there in the Greek means support. It's like having a picture with two nails. It supports, and the two supporting principles of the Ten Commandments is first, love for God, the first four commandments, then love for our neighbor. That's why you see the last six commandments are all relational. They are horizontal. The first four are vertical, all about our love to God. When you love God first, then it's a lot easier to love your neighbor as yourself. So the commandments can be summarized as ten principles about God's love for us, and our love for mankind. Clearly, let's continue to number five. How do we know that when God wrote the Ten Commandments, he did not any, add any other laws to it? This is very interesting. This is a confusing point in many Christian circles. How do we know that there was nothing else added to it? Deuteronomy 5, verse 22, and by the way, the Ten Commandments are not just in Exodus chapter 20, they are also in Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
Exodus is when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt. Deuteronomy is for the older generation. It is for the generation where the, when the children came out of Egypt, those that were young did not, did not understand the commandments very much. But in the book of Deuteronomy, these are now a reminder. As they get older, it's reiterated again. But notice what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 5.22. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly. In the mountain, from the midst of the fire, the cloud and thick darkness, with a what kind of voice? Loud voice, and let's say this together. And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. How much did God add? God added nothing more to the Ten Commandments. Why? Because they were complete. Four for God, six in our relationship to our fellow man. The Decalogue, the Ten Words of God. But somebody might ask the question, I could not help but this picture was so great. What's the difference? What's the difference? People ask that question, what's the difference? I like the commandments, I don't like the commandments. As long as I go to church, what's the difference? Walk with me now through the comparison of the law of God and the law of Moses. God's moral law and the ceremonial laws. Keep up with me. Here's the comparison. We're going to walk through these tonight in a strategic and very uh, building block way. The blue would be the moral law, the yellow, the ceremonial law. On the left, that is on my, on your right, just follow. <laughs> the Ten Commandments, only ten. But in the ceremonial system, there were more than 600 ordinances. More than 600. And the problem today is people lump them together, and here's the reason. When you say, I'm just a New Testament Christian, you miss 80% of the movie. So when you read the word law in the book of Romans or Galatians, you think it's all about the Ten Commandments when it's not. You got to understand how it got started to understand its application thousands of years later. Let's continue. The law of God compared to the law of Moses. What about the law of God? The law of God was written by who? God. The ceremonial law was written by who? Moses. We'll see this verified in a moment. The law of God was written on what? Stone. Moses' law was written in a book. Here's the verification of that. Joshua 23, verse 6. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. A book. A book is quite different. Let's look at the book. A book is quite different than stone. Moses is quite different than God. But God gave them both. God wrote one himself. He did not ask man to write it, but he gave Moses the instruction to write the other. Let's look at that. So God's law is perfect. Moses' law made nothing perfect. God's law is eternal. Moses' law is temporary. And here is the great transition. God's law existed before sin. Moses' law was added because of sin. So let's begin with a very important, very significant fact. Psalm 89, 14. Let's talk about God's government. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Let me ask a question. Can you be a just government without laws? System of justice, can a system of justice have no law? No, it's a fact. You can't even use the word just without having a law to compare that justice against. Can you imagine every country on the planet has a law? Do you expect God's government to be the only government without law? Is God's government lawless? You can do whatever you want? Absolutely not. The foundation of God's throne is one of righteousness and justice. Now let's walk through this, and this is something that's very significant. I want to spend a little time on this. We're going to look at the moral law and ceremonial law from the perspective of creation to the very end of time. I want you to peel your eyes on the screen. Here it is. Creation now, we see right here, God's law was there in the very beginning under point number A. And there was no sin between creation and the fall of man. How much sin? No sin at all. Between creation and the fall of man, there was no sin. But then Adam sinned. 
Let's look at what the Bible says. To verify this, Adam sinned, that's point B, and here it is, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man, what entered the world? Sin entered the world, and death through sin. So sin entered the world through who? Adam, not through Satan. Satan just simply presented the temptation, but Adam opened the door. Sin came into the human family through Adam. Adam is our father. He's the progenitor of the human race. We all took on Adam's nature. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 says it this way. For as in Adam, how many of us die? All die. But how could we die? Here's how. Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Now let's look at this now. Sin, Adam brings in sin. Sin brings death. And then death is the result of the wages. The wages. But now let's, that means sin requires a payment. And the payment for sin is what? Death. It requires that. But here's something very significant. Romans 5 and verse 13. And I'm reading this from the NIV because it made it so abundantly clear. Sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Could I get a speeding ticket if there's no speeding ticket law? Absolutely not. Adam could never have been guilty of sin in the very beginning if there was not a law that he violated. And by the way, on the, on the heels of violating God's law, Cain blank Abel. What's the blank? Cain killed Abel. Why was the killing of Abel a sin? Thou shall not kill. Thou shall do no murder. Thank you. Thou shall do no murder. And you find all throughout the Old Testament, long before anything was written on tables of stone, there was immorality, there was crime, there was violence, there was one sin after the other. But there could be no sin. Sin is not taken into account where there is no law. And even though it had not yet been written on stone, you find there's a 1,500-year period in Scripture where there's no written record. But that silence doesn't mean that God's morals were absent. Because Genesis 26 and verse 5 a lot of people say that the law of God was for the Jews. Abraham was born in Chaldea, Chaldea, a province of Babylon. Abraham was by birth a Babylonian citizen. But Genesis 26 and verse 5 says, Abraham kept my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. How could Abraham have known to do that except they were in existence? Sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Let's continue to see this fact. Romans 7, 7. I would have not known, I would not have known sin except how? Through the law. So we have all these laws in town. I, my wife and I were in um, London, driving around the city, rented a car, and we didn't have a clue about all the laws in London until I got a ticket in the mail from London. I got a ticket in my mail from London. And I didn't understand, what, I wasn't speeding, I made sure I wasn't speeding, but they said, you can only drive to certain parts of the city during the day if you buy a permit to go there during business hours. And they have more cameras in London than any place else on earth. I think New York is trying to catch up. They have, you speed, they're clicking cameras all the time. You can't even speed in London. So just driving downtown, passing by Harrods store, they sent me a picture of me driving downtown. That was me in the front seat. And on the front windshield, they said my sticker for permission to drive there during those hours was missing, so I got a fine. But there would have been no sin, there would have been no transgression, no violation, unless there was a law establishing these are the parameters of operation between these hours. If there is no law, there is absolutely no sin. And that's why Romans 7, 7, I would, I have, I would not have known sin except through the what? Law. Now let's look at this cadence. This is very significant. One of the reasons I'm a pastor is because of this list. Plan of salvation. Why do we preach the gospel? Let's say it together. No law, you say the second one. What is it? No sin. I say, no death, we need no what? No salvation. No savior, together. No gospel. 
You go backwards, we have a gospel because there is a Savior who offers salvation, saving us from death as a result of sin because of the violation of his law. If you teach that the law of God is done away with, close your church and sell watermelons. It troubles me when I hear pastors say, oh, it was nailed to the cross. It doesn't have to be kept. And I, I, I just itch to ask him, which one are you violating? Are you dishonoring your parents? Are you lying, stealing, committing adultery? Are you coveting? Are you bearing false witness against your neighbor? Are you taking God's name in vain? Are you bowing to idols? Are you worshiping images? Which one are you violating? You cannot look at the Ten Commandments and say that God is really, God, that's, I mean, that's like extreme. Why would you want us to do that? It's the greatest expression of God's love. So here's the point. There is no need to preach the gospel if there was no law. And here's the key. The Lord could have eliminated the law, let man do whatever he want, and there was no need for a Savior to come. I can't find a church on the planet that doesn't preach about a need to be saved. But why preach about a need to be saved and say that there is no law? It cancels itself out. Save from what? From death. Okay, let's follow that, Pastor. Death because of what? Sin. Really? But you told me there's no law. How could there be sin if there's no law? No law, no sin, no death, no salvation, definitely no need of a Savior, and there is no gospel. But the reason why there's a gospel today is because there is a Savior. What do you say? Paul continues. The very Paul that people try to do to get rid of the law, Paul says in Romans 4.15, for where there is no law, there is no what? There is no transgression. When you're speeding through town, you will not be stopped if, in fact, there is no law that prevents you from going above a certain speed limit. 1 John 3 and verse 4, the Bible makes it clear again, for sin is the what? Transgression of the law. Now, now that we have point B kind of nailed down, I'm going to give you something you haven't seen. Are you ready for it? Here it is. Let's look at this chart again. Not confusing at all. Let me walk you through it. In the very beginning, creation, the white areas, no sin. No sin until the fall of Adam. The yellow means from Adam all the way to the very end, sin and death is there. We have to deal with it. From the time Adam sinned, sin and death fell upon everybody that was ever born. On the very bottom, you see the blue line, God's law from creation all the way to the very end. But point C, you see something you did not see before, and it's in red. From between point C and point D, there's something called ceremonial law added until seed should come. Watch this. This is huge. This is how you know the difference between the two laws. One law was being violated so God put another law in place to teach us that someone was going to come to pay the penalty for that violated law and get us back in an unbroken relationship. It's like a city ordinance. Somebody says, you know, the speed limit is 20, 35, but we have to add another law because they keep speeding through the school zone. So you might be going 35, but then there's another law added because the law is different in a school zone. When you pass the school zone, that old law comes back into effect. You can go back up to 35. You get the point? When Adam sinned, God put a law in place to say, this law will be here to teach you about the coming Savior, and it's called a ceremonial law. Now watch this. You'll understand it. Galatians 3.19, this is why studying the Old Testament is so vitally imperative. Galatians 3.19, now Paul is addressing that very law, and that's why I have it in red, the ceremonial law. What purpose then does the law serve? Here's what he said. It was what? Added because of what? Transgression. This law was added because that one was violated. How long, Paul, was it supposed to be in effect? Till the seed should come. For how long? Till 
the seed should come. Oh, so it had a duration. Yes, till the seed should come. That's how long that law that was added was to be in effect. Till the seed should come. Say that with me. How long? Till the seed should come. And he continues. To whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now let's go to Galatians 3 and verse 16. He describes who the seed is. Galatians 3, 16. Speaking about Abraham, he says, he does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and your seed who is, say it, friends, Christ. So the seed that is to come is Jesus. Is that clear? The seed that everyone looked for from the fall of man was the coming of Jesus. That's why Jesus said to Adam and Eve in the garden, he said it to the serpent, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. That's why when the angel Gabriel showed up to Mary, he planted a seed in her, the promised seed. And that seed is the Christ. But why did the Lord give the ceremonial law? That ceremonial law was to teach Israel how to identify the seed when he arrives. Look at this. The ceremonial, the ceremonial law was a shadow. Every aspect of the temple services was a shadow to teach us something about the ministry of Jesus. So if you understand the ceremonial services from the outer court to the inner court, to the holy place, to the most holy place, to the high priest, to the different types of sacrifices, every single aspect of it describes something about the ministry of Jesus. It was a shadow. It was only to last till the what would come? Till the seed would come. Let's look at this. The Bible made it clear. Hebrews 10 verse 1, it starts describing. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of these things, here's why it was temporary, can never with these same sacrifices. There were no sacrifices mentioned at all in the Ten Commandments, not a single one. Can never with these same sacrifices, which they offered how? Continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Can you imagine the amount of blood that was shed? Lambs, bulls, goats, doves, slit the throat, drain the blood in a bowl, sprinkle it on the horns of the altar in the most holy place every day, morning and evening and night, every day, ceremony, day of atonement, more sacrifices, wave sheaf offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, day of atonement, all these ceremonies, all of these festivals, all pointing to the coming of Christ. That's why the Bible makes it clear. Galatians 3, verse 24 and 25. What was the purpose of this ceremonial system? Therefore, the law was our what? Tutor, teacher, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by how? Faith. But, oh, this is powerful. But after faith has come, we are no longer under what? A tutor. We don't need to kill a lamb. Can somebody say amen? Amen. I could get on my knees tonight and pray to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I don't have to go to the local Safeway and say, how much is a pound of lamb? Or can I buy a brand new lamb? No. When the lamb came, there was no need for the tutor any longer. Every day. That's why it was amazing to me when Jesus came and Jesus, through John, pointed, when John pointed to Jesus, and we'll get to that in a moment, it was shocking to me that these Jewish leaders who for more than 1,500 years had this tutor, they couldn't see the very presence, the very image of the shadow. I got a shadow on the ground. That shadow is not me. It just points to me. The ceremonial system was just a shadow, and if you followed it, it will take you right to Christ. That's why Paul says, Christ is the end of the law to those who believe. He didn't mean the end as in doing away with. He means if you follow that string and you get to the end of it, you'll find Christ. If you follow the ceremonial system, you get to the end of it, you'll find Christ. That's why Jesus said to John 5, 39, 
You search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. The Jewish priests spent all their time in the Pentateuch and the Torah, the first five books of Moses, trying to find salvation. And Jesus was right there. He said, you think, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they that testify of me. I'm right here. And they missed him. Because they got so enamored by the system of tutorship that they missed the Christ. Paul continues, Hebrews 9, verse 9 and 10. I abbreviated this intentionally. What was the purpose of that system? It was what? Symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the services perfect in regard to conscience. And what was, concluded, what was included in that? Verse 10, concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed, what is the next word, until the time of reformation. Heaven was counting the clock until Jesus came. That's why Galatians 4, 4 says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Can somebody say amen? amen. He said, enough of the blood, enough of the killing. Send the final lamb. Yes. In the symbolism of the ceremonial services, look at this. This is what you don't hear from Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes. <laughs> they don't know it. And you'll find out Friday night why they don't. You can't miss Friday night. You'll find out why this message cannot be preached by folks that just want your money or want to, want to dupe you into materialistic prosperity gospel. This is about salvation. It ain't about you getting something new. It's about a new life in Christ. You don't hear that. I wish I had 30,000 people listening to this tonight. Oh, wait, sorry. We got more than that. Sorry, Joel. 3 ABN covering more than 30,000, and you are the remnant. Praise God for that. I don't have nothing against Joel. I listen to him every now and then. He's a great guy. Let me just make that clear. He's got some wonderful sermons. You feel good. He can make a fly feel happy. But you know what? Being happy and being saved are not the same thing. Love the guy. I have nothing against him. But this is the gospel that saves and changes lives. Let's look at the symbolism. Because of all these things existed until the Reformation. Now let's look at the symbolism. Symbolism in the ceremonial law. What was the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant inside the tabernacle? It represents God's everlasting covenant that cannot be broken. Symbolism inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments inside of it. God's everlasting covenant, a representation of his character. Let's go on. What else was in the ceremonial services? The altar of incense representing the intercessory prayers, the high priest afore, uh, offered intercessory prayers, the prayers of the saints, a sweet-smelling savor. That's why when you pray, your prayers to God is a sweet-smelling savor. He loves to hear his children talk to him. That's the purpose of the altar of incense. Then we go, what about the candlesticks, the seven golden candlesticks? Seven meaning perfection. What did that represent? It represented Jesus, the perfect light of the world. That was symbolic. So when they lit those candles, they should have known this was a symbol of the coming Christ, the light of the world. You see, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he was climbing the steps of the temple during the offering in the afternoon, a great ceremonial system, and the sun hit Jesus as he climbed to the top of the steps, and he says, I am the light of the world. They should have known for 1,500 years, they had seen the tutor, and when he came, they missed it. It continues. What about the candlesticks when they are lit on fire? They are lit on fire by the olive oil. The olive oil represents the Holy Spirit working in our lives. It was a symbol. They should have known that Jesus was going to release on the New Testament church the power of the Holy Spirit, but they missed it. You know why they missed it? They rejected Jesus. They did not like how he came, so they rejected him and everything he brought with him. What about the altar of sacrifices? It represents the cross where Jesus gave his life. The lamb, the perfect sacrifice. It is only by the shed blood of Jesus that we can be saved. What about the table of showbread? Whenever they broke the table of showbread and ate the bread, it represented Jesus, the bread of life. All the symbols. What about the brazen label where the priest washed his hands? The water represented Jesus, the water of life. 
It was a shadow. When Jesus, the water of life, came, do I need to wash my hands to be cleansed from sin, or do I need to accept the saving grace of Christ to be saved? All symbols. When Jesus came, they continued. That's why when Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, bringing, and bringing an end to the sacrificial system. And so here we are, finally on the chart. The ceremonial system from creation, the white, to the fall of man, there was no sin. Then Adam sinned, and from Adam the yellow all the way to the very end of time, there is sin and death even today. But the ceremonial law was only to last until the seed should come. You see the red cross? Jesus had taught the seed. That's as long as the ceremonial law was to last. Because when Jesus came, there was no need for a tutor when the actual lamb is right here. That's why this proclamation was the most powerful proclamation that humanity could have ever received. Matthew 1, 21, call his name Jesus for what? He will save his people from their sins. And that's why John used these words. John 1, verse 29, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why would they hear the phrase lamb of God and not know that it meant Jesus? because they did not like how he came. They wanted Jesus to come on a nice white steed looking great and glorious, but he came on a donkey looking humble and lowly so that he could identify with the lowly. He can take the lowest and bring them up to the highest. That's Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it was also prophesied that the sacrificial system would end. Daniel 9, 27, he shall bring an end to sacrifices and offerings. And he did. The Apostle Paul recorded that. Colossians 2, verse 14. Having wiped out what? The handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having done what? Nailed it to the cross. Nailed it how? The lamb is on the cross carrying our sins, and at the high noon, the lamb that the priests were about to slay was set free. Wow. Because the real lamb died in place of a little infant lamb who could not atone for the sins of creation. We were not created by an animal. We were created by Christ. That's why he had to come to be the perfect sacrifice. And when he died, he ended the ceremonial system. That's why today preachers don't say, Pastor Miguel, where's your lamb? Where's your goat? Where's your bullock? Where's your dove? Oh, no. We can come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What do you say? Don't have to find some place to kill some lamb and sprinkle blood and mess the place up. We are saved by the blood of the lamb, the spotless lamb, Christ Jesus. But there was something else in the temple services I didn't talk about yet. Because all those ceremonies had to be carried out by someone and he was the high priest. That was also a symbol of the coming Christ. Hebrews 4 verse 14, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Who is he? Jesus, the Son of God. You see right here, he has on the ephod representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is a representation of the ministry of Christ now in the heavenly sanctuary. I wish I had a few more weeks. I could have taken you to Revelation and show you in John, in Revelation chapter 4, where John says, I saw a door open in heaven, and I saw a temple there. He's talking about the temple built on earth. In Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9, God gave Moses a glimpse of what was in heaven so he can build that tabernacle on earth. Moses didn't come up with the plans. God did. God said, in order for you to understand how I'm going to save you and all that I'm going to do to save humanity, you build a tabernacle. And that's why David the psalmist says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. He said to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. My brothers and sisters, today we are the sanctuary. Jesus wants to live within us. Can you say amen? He wants to abide in us. That's why the Bible says, here's the, here's the language, listen to this. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's sanctuary language. You don't have to kill lambs to be saved. You are the living sacrifice. God wants you to climb on the altar like Isaac did to Abraham. 
Abraham didn't force Isaac. Isaac loved his father so much. His father said, lay down on the altar. Isaac represents the, the sufficiency of Christ when his son, Jesus, laid on the altar to save us. God sent his son, and he willingly gave his life. He wants us to do the same thing. Make your life a living sacrifice. What kind? Holy and acceptable to God. Jesus is our eternal high priest. That's why when the ceremonial system was done away with, the Jews that rejected Jesus still tried to force men to keep the sacrificial system. But the problem is, the Gentiles, they said, you cannot keep it until you get circumcised. And Paul said, wait a minute. You don't need to be circumcised because there is no more earthly tabernacle. That's why he wrote these words. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, Paul says, circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. And all through the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, the Corinthian Christians had a hard time with the Jews that rejected Jesus. Said, cover your head when you come to church. All these ceremonial rituals they try to enforce on the Gentiles. And all Paul said we have to do is just honor the commandments of God by grace in Christ Jesus. So we continue. How did the psalmist David describe true reverence for God? Notice what he said in Psalm 112, in verse 1. He said, praise the Lord. What did he say? Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who what? Delights greatly in his commandments. When you understand the great price paid to save you, we should delight in honoring God's law. Now, let me make a very important point, and we'll, we'll amplify this on Friday evening you can't keep the law and be saved without Christ. But when you are in a saving relationship, you can't violate the law and still be saved. The law doesn't save you. The law is kept by those who love the Lord. I'll give you an example. Oh, husbands and wives, I hope you're ready for this. When your wife or your husband accepted the proposal, did you say to your spouse, now, here are all the laws in Contra Costa County that govern a relationship. When you agree to all these laws, then I'll marry you. Did you say that? No. What did you say? Honey, I love you. Would you, mar Would you marry me? You didn't say, here are all the laws in Contra Costa County about marriage. Would you marry me? You didn't say it, right? You know why they, you know why they keep those laws that govern marriage? Because they love you. That never comes into play until one of you knuckleheads decide to get out of the marriage, and then all of a sudden you are aware of all the laws that govern your relationship. Did I say knuckleheads? I, I don't know why I said that. Let's keep going. According to Jesus, professed religious leaders transgress the commandments. What reason prompted their guilt? Matthew 15, 3. He answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandments of God because of your what? Tradition. My friends, tonight, the issue is not God's law. The issue is tradition versus obedience. Tradition versus obedience. Question number eight. Why did Jesus give a scathing rebuke to the religious leaders of his day? Here's what he said in Matthew 15, verse 7 to 9. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But he goes on, but their heart is far from me. In, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, what? The commandments of men. You see, friends, today, tradition prefers the commandments of men over the commandments of God. Because people choose the commandments that fit into their way of life. I'm not going to keep that one because that doesn't fit my schedule. When you love the Lord, his schedule is more important than your schedule. Number nine. The heart condition that Jesus diagnosed is always the issue. What's wrong with the heart that rejects God's law? Paul once again says it. Romans 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Friends, the problem is the natural mind is hostile to the commandments of God. Why? Because a sinful heart will never desire to keep a perfect law. A sinful heart will never want to keep a perfect law. The issue is not God's law. When the heart is converted, the law of God is a pleasure and a delight. Number 10, what reason does the Apostle Paul give for not being able to keep God's holy law? 
Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? Carnal, sold unto sin. You see, friends, God's law is spiritual. Humanity is carnal. The problem is not that speed limit. It's the guy who has a heavy foot. Number 11. What did the Apostle Paul say about the law of God in comparison to his carnal condition? He even talked about himself. Romans 7, verse 12. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment together, holy and just and good. Yes, when you look at God's law, it's holy and just and good. What is it, friends? Holy and just and good. Number 12. You have to watch this again. I'm speaking like a New Yorker tonight. Here we go. Number 12. In spite of the holiness and perfect nature of God's law, what did Paul acknowledge as challenging him to keep it? Romans 7, verse 22 and 23, he says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. A lot of people think the law of sin is the law of God. No, my friends, the law of sin is not the law of God. The law of sin is human nature. We are bound. We talked about it two nights in a row. We are bound by a carnal nature given to us by Adam. The law of sin is the human nature. Here's the key. God's law is in our minds, but until we break that hold that sin has on us, until we yield to Christ, we are bound by our nature. The law of sin is human nature. Number 13, how did the, how did the Apostle Paul describe the remedy for his ability to keep God's law. Here's what he said in Romans 7, 24. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? As long as we are in this corrupt relationship, we can never live in harmony with an incorruptible law. He needed deliverance. Do we need deliverance? Everyone that's hostile to God's law needs deliverance. You see, friends, human nature is the law of sin and death, not God's commandments. Number 14, how did the Apostle Paul describe his deliverance? Here's what he said, and this is beautiful, Romans 8. You see, after he struggled with his nature, he found the secret to be victorious. Here's what he said in Romans 8, verse 1 and 2. There is therefore now what? No condemnation to those who are where? In Christ Jesus. The law cannot condemn you if you're in Jesus, but you got to walk right who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, that's the righteousness of Christ. In Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Only Jesus can free us. What do you say? Number 15, how the Apostle Paul describes how the requirements of the law was fulfilled. How could we fulfill God's requirements? Here's how, my friends. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives where? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who did what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Number 16. Number 16. Because of the strength that Christ provides, what does he ask us to do? I wish we could all say this together. John 14, 15. What do you say, friends? If you love me, keep my commandments. But here's the question. How do we know that through the power of Christ, the Ten Commandments can be kept? How do we know? People say it can't be kept. Why would Jesus say keep it? Is it a joke? Is it a trick? No. Only by him providing you his strength can the commandments of God be kept. He works in you to live in harmony with what he asks you to live in harmony with. How do we know they can be kept? The last book of the Bible, Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice it didn't say faith in Jesus, the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus was tried and never broken. The devil tried to break Jesus, but his faith never broke. Watch this. When you allow the faith of Jesus to come in you, temptation will come, but the devil can never break a saint who relies on the sufficient, un, in undefeated faith of Jesus. Don't ask me to say that again. 
The faith of Jesus is still undefeated. And when you are living by his faith, you will never fall prey to temptation or sin. Number 18, how imperative is it to keep God's commandments? 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4. Now by this we know that we know him, if we do what? Keep his commandments. That's how you know that you love the Lord. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, the Bible says, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's the test. If a preacher says, I love the Lord, ask him this, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? If he says no, run for your life, because he's a trap. Number 19, how do we know that the commandments were not abolished? Jesus' words, here it is, Matthew 5, verse 17 to 19, the words of Jesus. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That means everything that the ceremonial law said of me, I'm going to fulfill it. Everything. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever, therefore, verse 19, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, that's what I'm doing by God's grace. Lord Jesus, thank you for the grace. By God's grace, I can live in harmony with God's law by his grace. By whose grace? His grace. Whoever teaches them, and he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And my favorite last passage, Tim, does the devil believe the commandments can be kept? Let's ask him. Revelation 12, verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Why is Satan fighting against God's people? It's here's why. By the grace of God, let's finish the text together. Here's why he's upset. Who keep, together, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, those watching, those listening, tonight God is calling you to be obedient to Christ. Not, a, not religion, not church, not ecclesiastical authorities, not man. If what you have learned is not in harmony with God's word, follow God's word. Can we pray tonight? Father in heaven, we've spoken a lot, but I pray that through all of this, Jesus was exalted and lifted up. This is my prayer and my desire. May you always be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.